Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here, not just enjoyed. Thank you for giving me your hearts. You gave me your hearts. That doesn't always happen. In fact, very seldom does it do in the colleges that I go to. And so it's been such a blessing to speak to your heart and share my heart with you. So, talked a little bit about coming to Christ as a student at Cambridge, 18 years of age. Let me read you something I wrote about that a long time ago. I can remember the Bible Janet, the girl that led me to Christ, produced from nowhere and handed to me while we were in bed side by side in that ward at, at uh, hospital. She opened it to Luke chapter six, 5 and told me to read it. How could she have known that that was the most perfect piece of Bible for me to read? <clears throat> for you see, it's about Jesus calling fishermen. And my father was a fisherman, and I am my father's daughter. My dad would say to my sister and I, follow me, and I will make you fishes of fish. So we followed him because we loved him, and he taught us his trade. Many times when I was a little girl, I would ask my mother where my father was, and she would say, gone fishing. I know just where he'd be, up to the top of his long waders in the middle of a rushing river in the gorgeous English Lake District, Wordsworth country, or in Northern Ireland where the mountains of Morn sweep down to the sea. And I know exactly what fly he was using to catch what fish. After all, my sister and I had helped him to make them under the microscope during the long, dark English winter nights. So when I lay in that sterile ward all those years ago, packaged for healing, the sheets holding me quite securely in place, it all made perfect sense. And my heart gave a great responsive shout of faith. Yes! I get it! My father is a fisherman, and I am now my father's daughter. And I will follow him, because I love him, and he will teach me his trade. So you know the well-known passage that in God's economy, the girl who led me to Christ opened and said, read it. I read it. She said, now let me explain it to you. I said, you don't need to, I understand. <laughs> she said, how do you understand? And I replied in a little more informal way with words that I've just read to you. Jenny, my father's a fisherman, I'm my father's daughter, etc., etc. And so it makes good sense to me. You know the words well. Jesus, the side of Galilee, just beginning the redemption of the world, his three years on earth that he spent telling the world the kingdom had come. When Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've worked hard all, all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I wonder how he said that. Oh, okay. He was tired, he was wet. They hadn't caught anything. He wanted to go home and kiss his wife and pick up his kids and get to bed. What do you mean? Pull out into deep water. What do you mean go fishing? But he said, well, because you say so, just be obedient, even if you have to say it like that, you'll change your mind along the way. Because you say so, I looked down the nets, and when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners, they came with the other boat, and you know the story, and the fish began to commit suicide, you know, they're just jumping in like this. <laughs> Wonderful. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet, and he said, whoa, whoa, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. just like you and I would have said. Jesus said, don't be afraid, from now on you're gonna catch men. That's why this talk's called Gone Fishing. So, they pulled up their boats on shore, they left everything and everybody and followed him. 
Yes, undoubtedly one of the richest passages of Scripture in my life's experience. So, Jesus asked Peter, and my husband's got a fabulous book on Peter, and I can't remember the title. <laughs> I will before I'm through. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Okay. <laughs> fabulous. Uh, men love Peter, by the way. They say, I'm like Peter, I just always put my foot in my mouth, you know, things like that. <laughs> Jesus asked Peter three questions in his life. Peter, will you follow me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, will you die for me? And you can read that in Luke chapter 5, the gospel, and John 21, after the resurrection, when Jesus had breakfast with Peter in his resurrection body, remember? And I'm going to ask you the same questions on his behalf. Will you follow me? Do you love me? Will you die for me? So, will you follow me? As I lay in that hospital ward, Judy, uh, Jenny told me, I'm praying you won't get well yet. I said, well, gee, thanks. She said, I've got such a lot to tell you. And I know what you're going back to at college. I've seen your friends. I need time to tell you how to follow Jesus. And God answered her prayer, incidentally. <laughs> and I was there for 10 more days for no reason. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And, uh, thought they ought to do that before they let me leave. And they never did find out. One day, it was all gone. I guess God just took me in there to get me saved. I don't know. So, Peter, will you follow me? Uh, following Jesus, what happened that day? He said, Peter, I want your boat. I want your boat. He was getting pushed into the water. Do you remember the story? The crowd's coming, and, and he's, <laughs> he's, he's got Galilee behind him. And whoa, 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 whoa. If you had a leper you wanted healed, you'd push too. People crowding, people pushing, people shoving. Let me get near him, let me get near him. So he looks along, sees the boat, and he says, Peter, I want your boat. And he gets into the boat. I love this picture. Again, I'm a visual learner, I see this. He wants your boat. Listen to me. He wants to get into your life. He wants to be in your life and address the crowd on your shore. Okay? So what's your boat like? Sort of a boat. Little fishing boat? Ideal. Maybe it's big aircraft carrier. Maybe it's a submarine, does all its work out of sight. We're all different. He wants our boat. Figure out what your boat is. Because Jesus wants to sit in it and be Lord of the ship, Lordship. Okay? And he wants to address the crowd on your shore. Vivid picture. It was for me. And Jenny said, when you sail out of this ward, Jill, you're going back to Homerton College, Cambridge, and you've got a crowd on your shore. It's not like the crowd Jesus had, who wanted to listen to him, were intent on touching him. It'll be aggressive. It will be difficult. You'll lose all your friends. Why will I lose all my friends? Well, don't worry about it. God will give you new ones. <laughs> True, actually. I did lose all my friends. I roomed with a girl who never spoke to me again for the whole year. She was my roommate once I had tried to talk to her about Jesus. So, what's your boat like, Jill? And she asked me the question. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, what sort of a boat? What, what, what do you like doing? What, what are you talented to do? I said, like playing tennis, like skating, like having fun. That's good. God will use tennis and skating. He'll use sports, which he has in my life, all over the world, as I've spoken in sports ministries things. Uh, Use tennis, put on 
tennis tournaments down in the, not right in the city for kids that had never had a chance to do anything like that. And then I had the Salvation Army band and we had a pig roast and talked about Jesus. Yeah, think about it. What sort of a boat have you got? How talented are you? How gifted? Uh, he's going to use everything. And he will say to you, as he said to Peter, now let's go to deep water. Listen to me. The big fish are not in the shallows around the church or in the church. You don't fish in a swimming pool. That's the church. You fish outside in the dark pools and the rivers, the dangerous places. Put out into the deep. He's saying it to all of us. Whatever sort of a boat you have, even a little fishing vessel, it's going to get a bit rough out there for a little fishing vessel, but that's where the big fish are, folks. And I remember coming back to that passage one night down in Liverpool, and the stories I told you as a teacher down there, and God said to me, okay, let's go fishing, Jill. Let's go to the deep waters where the big fish are. And getting on a bus and going back to the red light district. So, he will use everything you are. Make a list of your talents and gifts. In the end, Jenny pushing me, she said, what do you like doing most? And I said, I just like playing with words. She said, oh, that's wonderful. She took me to Ecclesiastes 12, read it sometime. It's what Solomon did with words and how he did it and how he cataloged them and how he ordered them and how he illustrated them. Fabulous. She said, uh, God will use your words. Yeah. So I went fishing. And what's happened from 60 odd years ago to now? He's asked me the second question. After Peter had thoroughly messed up and denied his Lord, and the cross happened, and the resurrection happened, you know what happened in John 20, 21. They went fishing and again caught nothing. And that's why I said he was a lousy fisherman. He never seemed to catch anything. And suddenly, in the dawn, there was a figure on the coast. And John said, who's that? He's making a fire as early as this. There's somebody out there. And Jesus, caught anything? It's the Lord. And do you remember? Peter went over the edge expecting to walk on water again. <laughs> and he didn't that time. <laughs> so he splashed his way to the shore and had a talk with Jesus. And the others brought the boat to the shore, came along afterwards. And there was a charcoal fire there. And the cock was crowing. Ow. Every day of his life, Peter would hear the cock crow, and he would eat his breakfast over a charcoal fire searing, right? And here was the resurrected Jesus and said, let's have a talk, you and me. Peter, do you really love me? Referring back to before Jesus was arrested, when the disciples had been walking up towards that event, arguing who was biggest and greatest, and Peter saying, me, and the disciples talking, and Jesus turning around and rebuking them. What are you talking about? And they all began to say, I'll follow you, I'll follow you, I love you, I love you. And, and Peter, big mouth, he was the biggest of all. Uh, and he said, I don't know what these guys will do. Do you remember this incident Peter said on the road? But I'll love you. I don't know if they will love you. I love you. I'll go with you. I feel. And Jesus said, uh, do you really love me? Searing, he, he plays with words, I've no time to explain it to you. 
agape, uh, agape, the love of God, phileo, human love, eros, sensual, sexual sort of love. He used the agape word. Do you agape me? Do you love me as I love you? The love of God, John 3.16, is uh, a love that transcends everything else. I will love you whether you love me or not. That's the love of God. I will love you whether you ever love me back or not. I will love you even if you reject me. I will love you. That's agape. Phileo is, I will love you if you love me, basically. I might manage to love you if you don't love me, but it can never last. Phileo. Eros, the love, the feeling too big for words. Feeling, sensual, sexual side of love. Uh, Jesus uses agape. Peter says, you know, Lord, you know what I did. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know. I'm, I thought I loved you. I'm sorry, Lord. I only phile owe you. He answered with the lesser word. You know. He asked him again, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> Lord, <laughs> you know. I only have, I thought I loved you, agape, but... I have this little tiny bit of phileo love. Third time Jesus said, and it just about finished him off with the charcoal fire reminding him and the cock crowing, and he said, Lord, you know everything. And Jesus said, I'll take the love you've got, Peter, a little bit of love, and I'll grow it, and I'll grow it until you love me enough to die for me, which Peter did much later on. He doesn't just want us to follow him and do Christian things. He wants our heart. Has he got your heart? All of your heart? Or do you keep a little bit for this and a little bit for that or a little bit for you? Dare to give him all of it. Agape style. Do you love me? And then, the big question. Will you die for me? Will you die for me? You and I will die one day. We don't know when. He has numbered our days, remember? So we may apply our heart unto wisdom and use them wisely. We just don't know. I have a dear friend who's 50, busy dying of cancer. She lost her 17-year-old daughter in an accident two months ago. You just never know. You can't keep yourself alive, have you noticed? Do you know that? And don't fall into the devil's trap of thinking, when, then, I'll live for him and I'll die for him. You don't know if there's a when. He has numbered your days. I remember sitting on that plane on 9-11 and hearing the pilot say something's happened, there's a national emergency, and, and my first thought was uh, we're going down, and then emptying the gas into the ocean and the noise and my conversation with the young doctor next to me. Have you ever heard that noise before? No, I haven't, and I'm a, a million mile flyer, he said. Uh, he said to me, I think we're going down. I said, so do I. I'd never heard anyone empty the gas into the ocean in all my flying days. And it's a horrible noise. It's just opening the... Like when they're putting the wheels down, you hear, and he was opening the... I don't know, to let the uh, oil out before he landed, because it was dangerous to fly with so much. And uh, immediately the pilot came on and said, it's all right, it's all right, I'm just uh, emptying the gas. And the doctor said to me, I don't think he's telling us the truth. I said, nor do I. Interesting, as soon as he told us that, everybody dived for that thing you never read. <laughs> me too. Mm. So complicated, that thing. Have you noticed? I'd never noticed till then how complicated it was. 
and it fell silent. It was interested when you get into an emergency like that or other things. At first, there's a buzz, 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 and then silence. There was nobody talking, all shut up to our own immediate thoughts, and it was silent. And I began to have my conversation, and I first apologized to God because I said to him, Lord, I love you dearly, but I just wasn't expecting to see you today. Sorry. I was very ashamed of myself. I, I didn't want to die. And actually, I realized immediately, it would have been fine. Heaven's fine. I know where I'm going. It's getting there we're frightened of, right? It was just how I was going to get there. I didn't want to do to get there. And I know he smiled, and I think I shared this with you and said, let's try and do a little bit better from now on, Jill. Yes. So. But my immediate reaction was, I want to live. I want to follow you. I want to fish. I want to go. I want you to use my boat. Funny when you're faced with, will you die for me? There is a natural dying for all of us. There is a daily dying Paul talks about. Have you ever prayed at the beginning of a day, help me to die a little bit to my selfish self today? I, I hate praying that prayer. Try it, though. <laughs> and he'll give you an opportunity, I promise you. I dare you to. Uh, we, we're all about me. Well, I'm all about me. I don't want to speak for you. I mean, I don't think I am half the time, and then something happens, and I realize I am all the time. So loving him and dying for him daily to my wants. For example, in missions, I shared with you how Stuart unexpectedly was called away all those years. Uh, I, I didn't expect that. In fact, we had three choices when we came out of, of work our careers to go into missions, and we chose the only one that meant we could do it together. <laughs> Around the corner of your grand, any place, anywhere, Lord Jesus, in that missionary convention, I remember standing up when that call came and saying, any place, any time, anything. Around the corner of your glad, anywhere, Lord, there's an oh, no, I never expected this. In fact, I wrote a little booklet, of, oh, no, I never expected this for missionaries. Because around the corner of that decision, you will be surprised. Uh, we were surprised. He was asked to run the big center, the hub of that whole mission organization. And when we got there, within a year, the head man of that organization said, you, we have people giving us castles all over the world. We lived in a castle. Somebody in Austria wanted to give the mission a castle. Somebody in uh, Norway gave us a castle. Because we had a castle, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> and uh, Stuart uh, and Major said, we can plant this mission in Europe, and I need you to help me. And, oh, I never expected this. Not 10 months of the year for 10 years. Three kids. Oh, I never expected this. Will you follow me? Will you love me like I love the world? I remember having a talk with the Lord about it, and he said, yes, I, I had to leave home for 33 years, Jill. Lord, did you want to go back? Oh, yeah. What was it like being separated like that? You know, don't you now, a little bit of it, Jill? Yeah. Will you die a little bit to your dreams? Will you die a little bit to good dreams? Serving Jesus together. It's better than that. Do you really love me? And then will you die for me? So there can be a personal, physical dying that we have to cope with. And I've been a pastor's wife for 60 years now. No, I'm sorry. 40, 55 years or something like that. I'm no good at math. I married a bank inspector. I should never have done that. <laughs> so, I remember when we first got married. This has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> he came home and he said, Jill, um, after the first month of marriage, um, can I see the books? I thought he meant start a library. 
he meant, I want to see the accounts. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, all the things you've, you've bought, you know, the groceries and stuff. I said, what, what's books? He said, well, you write accounts, Jill. Where is it? I said, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> I said, you mean you want me to write down everything I spend? Remember my background, small doubt nabby. He said, yes. So he would go catching criminals in the bank, looking at all the accounts all week. Clever. Ah, oh, that's how they did it, cooking the books, we'd say. Then he'd come home to his wife, and it would take him all evening to figure out how I'd made it balance. <laughs> and it took me all day <laughs> to do it and to hide this and to add that, you see. <laughs> So I remember the, the end of the third month, I think, <laughs> he's trying to figure it out, and he looks at me and he says, what's this at the bottom? And, and you know where, where you would put balance? I didn't know that word, so I'd put left to spend. <laughs> and he sighed and looked at me and he said, oh, all right, where is it? And I said, I've spent it. <laughs> So at that point, for the sake of our marriage, we gave that up. <laughs> and I have never kept books since. <laughs> have to adapt to each other. Give a little. Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we love him with all our heart and soul, practically? And can we die for him? Little deaths. Little deaths and the big death. And it has been our experience in the last 10 years of our travel to have the huge privilege of being in countries where people are physically dying for Jesus and to be working with the church underground. Now, we worked with the church underground for 50 years. You see, Stuart and I have lived through Nazism, communism, 50 years, where we work behind the Iron Curtain in secret. Now terrorism, and it's sort of deja vu for us, all of this. Stuart and I keep looking at each other as the news comes and comes, or we arrive in one of those countries and saying, this is just like it was. Does this sound familiar to you? Yeah. In fact, the last speech that the North Korea man made about the rocket heading our way was if you just changed the language, a speech I heard Hitler give. Deja vu, right? So what does that mean for the church? Circle the wagons, don't come near me, keep me safe, no. It didn't mean it in the first century, and it doesn't mean it now. There is more urgency than ever and I want to tell you something, all the easy places have gone in missions. And the most needy and the most responsive are waiting. I told you that the first message. So, <laughs> Peter and his wife, both martyred, go to Rome, you'll see the picture, you'll see the prison they kept him in, and all the stuff they did to them. They say that he was crucified upside down. Jesus had told him that would happen in John 21. He told him the good news, and then he told him the bad news. One day you will stretch forth your hands and be led where you do not want to go. And that's how you're going to glorify me by your death, etc. So I think it was four or five years ago, we were in India with um, a seminary there, fabulous seminary, Indian seminary with 800 young Indians training to walk into a Hindu village or a Muslim village uh, where they, if they were women, they would not be killed. If they were men, they would be to take the gospel. And Stuart and I have worked with that organization many years. It's near Orissa, which those of you that follow missions will know, blew up uh, ha actually the month that we arrived there and that's very close to the seminary. Actually, it was 
the conflict between other religions and the Christians just got caught up in it and added to the martyrs, basically. They were the fathers and mothers of the children we had, 800 students. Uh, and actually, as I'm looking out at you, in the seminary place, it's very, very similar. And I remember it very clearly. Uh, it was very dramatic, and I've no time to tell you all those stories. But um, it had been a very, very difficult and stretching time for us with the missions people and then with these beautiful young students. And it was the last night <clears throat> we had police there trying to protect everybody in the seminary. They didn't know if their parents were dead or alive or if they got out into the forest at that point. And Stuart, and they said, well, Stuart and Jill, just continue. Just, you've given us two weeks teaching, but just let's have a meeting every night. And we prayed all day and night and all of this stuff. And then the last night came, and I listened to my husband give this most incredible message, absolutely incredible. And he simply talked about taking up our cross and following him all the way home. All the way home. All the way home. I sat there being so grateful that the next day we were going to try and get out of there and home. I'd had it in every sense. Emotionally, I was done. Oh, good. And as I sat there listening and bowed my head for the prayer, the Lord and I began to talk, and I had, I don't have visions, but I had a picture he gave me in my head. It was a wall, and there was a cross against it. And the Lord said to me, is that your cross, Jill? And I said, yes, Lord. He said, are you done? I said, yeah. He said, who are you expecting to carry it home for you? And I sat there for a long time until I could say, okay, all the way home. All the way home, Lord. All the way home. And that night and the week I wrote this, my prayer in India, March 2015. Am I one of his disciples that heard his voice one day, who understood the call of Christ to follow come what may? And did I follow faithfully until the way got tough then lay my cross against a wall and say I'd had enough. When life began to cost me much of things I held most dear, did I slow my pace, change my mind, and give way to my fear? Adapt the call to fit my life at some point in my traveling, and did my heart abandonment to God begin unraveling? Did I once have eyes to notice what a lost, when a lost sinner fell? Did I interrupt my selfish life to tell who saves from hell? Or lay my cross against a wall, protect my heart from breaking, and say it was just too extreme, this leaving or forsaking? Did he become a passing thought, a dream, unreal, a part, and not my constant focus or the one who gripped my heart? Did I give my whole allegiance to the people in my life and try and live a lifestyle that avoided pain and strife? So things that used to break me up, like kids who were abused, no longer touched a nerve in me. Was my conscience grow confused? My heart grow cold and callous, so I didn't want the cost when in some grubby bedroom a child's innocence was lost. When did I stop crying about that, Lord? Right then, when I lay my cross down, did I find a way to clarify my conscience and my choices? 
Did I learn to turn deaf ears to lost and lonely voices? Did I eat my way to fatness while a sinner begged for bread? Did I quit my Bible teaching while my world had not been fed? Will I follow you, my Jesus, take up my cross again? Will I carry it right home with me, whatever loss or pain? Yes, I give you all my days and hours and lift my eyes on high. So send me, spend me. Use me, Lord, until the day I die. Pray with me. And I just want to bring you into his presence and let you respond to whatever in this golden silence he gives us in this moment. Just block out everybody and everything. What has he said to you in these few days we've had together? Talk to him, will you? Talk to him. Lord Jesus, I love you all the way home, all the way home, all the way home. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in thanking Jill Briscoe? Thanks, JBU.